Father, we thank thee for all of your blessings towards us. We pray now that we may be open to understand your will. May we see, may we understand, and may we decide to follow what you say. Bless us now, we pray. Amen. We are looking at the biographies of different people. We started with Adam and we're now up to Eve. So we'll pick it up from there. We're looking at Councils on Health, page 108. Eve was beguiled by the serpent and made to believe that God would not do as he said. She ate and thinking she felt the sensation of a new and more exalted life, she bore the fruit to her husband. The serpent had said that she should not do that and she felt no ill effects from eating the fruit, nothing which could be interpreted to mean death, but instead a pleasurable sensation which she imagined was as the angels felt. Her experience stood arrayed against the positive command of Jehovah, yet Adam permitted himself to be seduced by it. Thus we often find it, even in the religious world, God's express commands are transgressed. And because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil, Ecclesiastes 8.11. Now, we read several things in this comment that are happening today. So what Eve did is not something that we don't know about. <laughs> we do the same thing. All right, we go to uh, Steps to Christ, page 40. The woman put the blame upon the serpent, saying, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So she didn't say, I decided. She said, The serpent. <laughs> Why did you suffer him to come into Eden? <laughs> These were the questions implied in her excuse for his sin, thus charging God with the responsibility of their fall. The spirit of self-justification. That's an interesting word, self-justification. Originated in the father of lies and has been exhibited by all sons and daughters of Adam. By all. That doesn't mean they're born innocent and then they become sinners. But that's being taught by many people today. And they get all upset when you say, no, they were not born innocent. They were sinners. And they can't figure out how they became sinners. Well, the Bible tells us Adam and Eve sinned and all of their posterity is sinners. Now, some people may not like me saying that over and over again, but it's enough of a problem. We need to say something. And we're not saying it. The Spirit of Prophecy says it. Okay. Manuscript 37, 1906. False theories repeated again and again appear as falsely inviting today as did the fruit of the forbidden tree in the Garden of Eden. The fruit was very beautiful and apparently desirable for food. Through false doctrines, many souls have already been destroyed. So false doctrines keep you lost. False doctrines are not a simple thing that just goes by and it's not dangerous. It destroys people. Now, we could put under the false doctrines a lot of things. Sunday is just one of them. State of the dead is another one. 
there's another one that's going to destroy a lot of people, and they don't know it. They think it's the gospel. They read the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, and they think they see the gospel in it. Righteousness by faith. It is not the gospel. It's not even in the Bible. We ought to look at it carefully. Righteousness, which comes through faith in Christ, that's the gospel. But not righteousness by faith, because that doesn't tell you faith in what? All right. Consults on diet and foods, page 145. Eve had everything to make her happy. She was surrounded by fruit of every variety. Yet the fruit of the forbidden tree appeared more desirable to her than the fruit of all the other trees. <laughs> that one fruit was more desirable to her. She ate, and through her influence, her husband ate also, and a curse rested upon them both. The earth also was cursed because of their sin. And since the fall in temperance is almost, in almost every form has existed. In temperance in every form has happened since they ate. Education 25 and 26. Your eyes shall be opened, the enemy had said. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Their eyes were indeed opened, but how sad the opening. The knowledge of evil, the curse of sin, was all that the transgressors gained. There was nothing poisonous in the fruit itself. So there was nothing wrong with the fruit. It's because they ate of it after God expressed his will that they shouldn't. And the sin was not merely in yielding to appetite, it was distrust of God's goodness, disbelief in his word. So, the first sin, and it was counted sin with death following, the sin was not what they did. The sin was disbelieving his word. Is anybody doing that today? Well, he says he is the Son of God. He said it three times on the earth. And he has said it many other times through his word, through the spirit of prophecy. Jesus is the Son of God. Do people in the churches believe that today? No, they don't, because their ministers tell him that's a metaphor. Of course, the Bible never says it's a metaphor. Now, the people are taking the word of the ministers who are taking the words of the seminary, which are taking the word of all the scholars through history, instead of taking the word of God. And rejection of his authority that made our earth's parents transgressors. Man lost all because he chose to listen to the deceiver rather than to him who is truth, who alone uh, has understanding. By the mingling of evil with good, his mind had become confused, his mental and spiritual powers benumbed. No longer could he appreciate the good that God had so freely bestowed. No longer were they to dwell in Eden, in drooping flower and falling leaf. Adam and his companion witnessed the first signs of decay. Even the air upon which their life depended bore the seeds of death. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 58. Eve was told of the sorrow and pain and must henceforth be her position. And the Lord said, Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. See, before she ate that fruit, they were equal. But the second she ate it, 
Now she had to follow what he says. In the creation, God had made it the equal of Adam had they remained obedient to God. There's the word that nobody wants to hear. Obedience. Obedience is still necessary today. It's not something that people tack on to a comfortable religion of righteousness by faith. Obedience is what gets you into heaven in harmony with the great law of love. So obedience to the law is what it's all about. They would ever have been in harmony with each other, but sin had brought discord and now their union could be maintained in harmony preserved only by the submission on the part of the one or the other. So people are not equal anymore. There has to be submission. Eve had been the first in transgression and had fallen into temptation by separating from her companion, contrary to the divine direction. It was by her solicitation that Adam sinned. So Adam would not have sinned had it not been for Eve telling him to sin. So Adam was tempted by Eve successfully. And she was now placed in subjection to her husband. Now, women aren't like that today, at least not in the Western world. In the East, they still do it, subjection to the husband. But they don't believe that anymore. Today, women go to work. They become presidents of corporations and all kinds of things they do. They are not in subjection to men anymore. And would it prove, that would have proved a blessing to them about man's abuse of the supremacy. Oh. <laughs> Thus given him has too often rendered the lot of women very bitter and made her life a burden. So, there are two sides to it. Men were given the supremacy over the woman because of what the woman did, but then they misused it and have turned their life into something terrible. Manuscript 17, 1891. It was not the design of God that the husband should have control as head of the house when he himself does not submit to Christ. So when men say, we are the rulers of the household, if they're not submitted to Christ, no, they're not. <laughs> so they have messed it all up for themselves. Messages to young people, page 75. You are not happy, yet you imagine that if you could have your own way unrestrained, you would be happy. Poor child, you occupy a position similar to that of Eve in Eden. She imagined that she would be highly exalted if she could only eat of the fruit of the tree, which God had forbidden her even to touch, lest she die. She ate and lost all the glories of Eden. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 3, page 483. In attempting to climb higher than her original position, she fell far below it. This will most assuredly be the result of the ease of the present generation if they neglect to cheerfully take up their daily life duties in accordance with God's plan. So they're going to fall way below, just like he did. There is a work for women that is even more important and elevated than the duties of the king upon his throne. So women have a part to play in life that's very high. They may mold the minds of their children and shape their characters so that they may be useful in this world and that they become sons and daughters of God. Now, I want to ask you a question right after that sentence.
do we become sons and daughters of God when we believe in the cross? Do we become sons and daughters of God when we believe in Jesus dying for us? Now you be very careful with this. Is that when you became a son and daughter of God? You see, we don't become sons and daughters of God until Jesus comes back. Then it's permanent. So we've all been taught that as soon as you believe, you're saved. That's not true. We are saved from the past, but there's still all the future in front of us. You'll have to think that through and really get it in your head. You really do not have eternal salvation until Jesus comes back. And neglect on the part of women to follow God's plan in her creation and effort to reach for important positions which she has not qualified her to fill. There it is. We must be qualified to fill. Leaves vacant the position that she could fill by acceptance. In getting out of her sphere, she loses the womanly dignity and nobility. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 594. If married men go into the work leaving their wives to care for the children at home. Wife and mother is doing fully as great and important as work as the husband and father. The husband in the open missionary field may receive the honors of men, while the home toiler may receive the early credit for her labor. But if she works for the best interest of her family, seeking to fashion their characters out the divine model, the recording angel writes her name as one of the greatest missionaries in the world. So there are women who have that written by their names. They are great missionaries. And that's what God reads. That's what Jesus says. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 55. Eve really believed the words of Satan. Think about that. She really believed what Satan was saying. Well, why didn't God take that into consideration? She really believed. <laughs> yeah, God couldn't take it into consideration. She believed what Satan said. But that didn't change. It was a lie. But her belief did not save her from the penalty of sin. She disbelieved the words of God. Now that's the important part. She not only believed Satan, she believed because she disbelieved what God said. That was the problem. And this was what led to her fall. In the judgment, men will not be condemned because they conscientiously believed a lie. So all the people in all the churches that believe all the lies, it's not going to save them they conscientiously believe it. It's a lie. But because they did not believe the truth. Well, what's the truth? There is no Holy Spirit. That's the truth as a person. But there is a Holy Spirit in Jesus. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Son of God, according to everything in the Bible. But if people conscientiously believe their ministers and their church and say, no, that's a metaphor, they can't be saved. Now, isn't that interesting? We don't think about it that way. How is it possible they're not going to be saved? They believe a lie. And because they really believe it doesn't change anything. Because 
they neglected the opportunity of learning what is the truth. They neglected the opportunity by listening to the pastor all the time. All the lessons which God has caused to be placed on record in his word are for our warning and instruction. So the word is where we get the truth, not what men say about it, not what churches teach about it, what the word itself says. And I don't see how anybody can read the word and come up with Jesus is a metaphor. How could he be a metaphor? That would mean he, he lied and his father lied and the angels lied. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 72. In the face of the most positive commands of God, men and women will follow their own inclinations and then dare to pray over the matter. <laughs> See, they say they pray over it, and they still follow their own way. <laughs> to prevail upon God to consent to allow them to go contrary to his expressed will. The Lord is not pleased with such prayers. Satan comes to the side of such persons as he did to Eve in Eden and impresses them and they have an exercise of mind and this they relate is a most wonderful experience which the Lord has given them. A true experience will be in perfect harmony with natural and divine law. False experience will array itself against science and the principles of Jehovah. Now when she says Jehovah here, that means Jesus. Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is all the way through Isaiah. If we read the things properly and say this means Jesus, We'll see it there. Jesus is the Son of God, Isaiah 9, 6. Jesus is the Comforter. Jesus is God himself. So all those things come together in Isaiah. If we read through, almost all the things in there that are prophecies deal with Jesus. We have to re-educate our mind. We got a whole different thing from what people told us. Review and Herald, November 8, 1892. The lying spirit that enticed Eve in Eden finds acceptance with the majority of Earth's inhabitants today. So she just laid it out. The lying spirit is what people listen to. The devil says it, they believe it. Even the Christian world refuses to be converted to the spirit of God. Now she just told us what the Holy Spirit is. It's God. It's not a separate spirit. Even the Christian world refuses to be converted by the Spirit of God, but listens to the Prince of Darkness as he comes to them in the garb of an angel of light. The spirit of Antichrist is prevailing in the world to a far greater extent than it has ever prevailed before. And of course, that's James 2.22. When a person will not listen to the Father and the Son, and it says there's no Holy Spirit, that is the spirit of Antichrist. That's all we'll read on Eve. We move over to Cain, the first son. The word Cain means acquisition, gotten. That's what they said when he was born. Oh, we've got the man. Who's going to save us? Desire of Ages, page 31. The Savior's coming was foretold in Eden. 
When Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfillment. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping he might be the deliverer. Spiritual Gifts, page 47. Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam, were very unlike in character. Abel feared God. Cain cherished rebellious feelings and murmured against God because of the curse pronounced upon Adam and because the ground was cursed for his sin. So he knew about the curses. He didn't like it one bit. So that is right. Everything gets cursed because of what Adam did. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 71. He permitted his mind to run in the same channel that led to Satan's fall, indulging the desire for self-exaltation and questioning the divine justice and authority. So he questioned the actual authority of God and the fact that that was divine justice. Well, lots of people do that today. They even had a movement called God is Dead. That's how much they wanted not to have his authority over them. So the modern world is nothing more than what Adam and Eve did. It's still here. Review and Herald, November 24th, 1896. In every offering to God, we are to acknowledge the one great gift that alone can make our service acceptable to him. Now, I want you to understand that sentence, and don't ever let it go. The one great gift. Was that one great gift the Father? Was it a separate Holy Spirit person? Now, that wouldn't be one great gift. The one great gift is Jesus. He is the Savior. He's the only one that went to the cross. We must remember, we only have one Savior. And he is the one that makes everything he did work for us. The Holy Spirit brings it to our hearts. So we've got to get these thoughts down because these are not the thoughts that people get in church. They are not taught these things. They say it was three beings that are one God. Well, you don't find that anywhere in the Bible. Let's keep going here. Cain brought only of the fruit of the ground and his offering was not accepted by the Lord. It did not express faith in Christ. That's the only time faith saves when we have faith in Christ. You have to have those three words together. When you say righteousness by faith, that doesn't work because you can have faith in anything. All our offerings must be sprinkled with the blood of the atonement as the purchasing possession of the Son of God, we are to give the Lord our own individual lives. And of course, the words Son of God are there. She never says in all of her writings, God the Son. She never says it. He is not God the Son. He is the Son of God. Now, that doesn't mean he's not God. Because if he's the Son of God, he is whatever God is. Christ Object Lessons, page 152. Cain thought himself righteous. <laughs> Isn't that something? <laughs> he thought of himself as righteous. Well, he took after Eve because she believed she could tell the difference between right and wrong. So he thought he had the same thing. That's where his downfall was. And he came to God with a thank offering only. He made no confession of sin. 
and acknowledged no need of mercy. The sense of need, the recognition of our poverty and sin, is the very first condition of acceptance with God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now mind you, an innocent person with no sin doesn't have that. So if babies were born innocent, they would not have what it takes to be accepted with God, which is to acknowledge your poverty of spirit. The whole thing is against God. It's amazing that people believe that. Spiritual Gifts, page 47. Cain brought his offering unto the Lord with murmuring and infidelity in his heart in regard to the promised sacrifice. He was unwilling to strictly follow the plan of obedience and procure a lamb and offer it with the fruit of the ground. He did not want to accept the plan of obedience. Almost all people who call themselves Christians believe the same thing. They want to say that Jesus obeyed for them. So that's the first thing we need to recognize in that sentence. The plan of obedience. Not the plan of Jesus obeying for me. That's only good for half of the plan of salvation. The other half is my learning obedience. He was unwilling to strictly follow the plan of obedience and procure a lamb and offer it. He merely took of the fruit of the ground and disregarded the requirement of God. So the plan of salvation is the plan of obedience. You never hear that in the church, any church. Cain was not particular to bring even the best of the fruits. So there was no obedience in him. He didn't want to know about it. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 72. Cain came before God with murmuring and infidelity in his heart in regard to the promised sacrifice and necessity of sacrificial offering. His gift expressed no penitence for sin. He had no penitence. He felt as many now feel that it would be an acknowledgement of weakness to follow the exact plan marked out by God. Well, what's the plan marked out by God? Well, the first thing is we have to come to Christ. He gives the person penitence. In that penitence, they're sorry for sin, and they give it up. They receive Christ, and they have power to not sin now. As they go through life, it's becoming their habit to not sin. When they die or when Jesus comes back, either one, wherever they are, that's the way they stay forever. They do not change when Jesus comes. They stay the way they are if they have endured to the end in their penitence and learning righteousness. Now they're saved. From that point on, they have eternal life. That is not taught in the churches. But that's the plan that God laid out. He chose the course of self-dependence. He would come on his own merits. He would not bring the lamb and mingle its blood with his offering, but would present his fruits, the product of his labor, he presented his offering as a favor done to God, <laughs> through which he expected to secure the divine approval. Cain obeyed in building an altar, obeyed in bringing a sacrifice, but he only rendered a partial obedience. 
People aren't even partially obeying today. They let it all go. The essential part, the recognition of the need of a Redeemer, was left out. The only people who can obey God are the ones who receive the merits of Christ. For some reason, they just throw that away. They use the merits of Christ to do away with all their sins that they're doing. Well, he doesn't do that. That's for the sins that are past. In Christianity, we're supposed to stop sinning. Now, he forgives us if we sin, but we're supposed to be giving it up. Testimonies to Ministers, page 77. Because iniquity abounds, the love of many waxes cold. There are many who have outgrown their Advent faith. Well, she's talking about Adventists here. They are living for the world. And while saying in their hearts as they desire it shall be, my Lord delayeth his coming, they are beating their fellow servants. That's leaders beating the people that are under them. They do this for the same reason that Cain killed Abel. Abel was determined to worship God according to the directions God had given. This displeased Cain. He thought that his own plans were best that the Lord would come to his terms. Cain in his offering did not acknowledge his dependence upon Christ. He thought that his father Adam had been treated harshly in being expelled from Eden. The idea of keeping that sin ever before the mind and offering the blood of the slain lamb was a confession of entire dependence upon a power outside of himself was torture to the high spirit of Cain. So it was just torture to think about the plan of God how to get saved. What do you mean? Be perfect. Nobody can do that. <laughs> but that's the plan. We're to become perfect in Christ. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 72. So far as birth and religious instruction were concerned, these brothers were equal. Both were sinners. Notice, Cain was not born innocent and he learned how to sin. They were both born sinners. She says it so many different ways. And both acknowledged the claim of God to reverence and worship. To outward appearance, their religion was the same, up to a certain point. <laughs> Cain had the same opportunity of learning and accepting these truths as had Abel. He was not the victim of an arbitrary purpose. One brother was not elected to be accepted of God and the other to be rejected. Abel chose faith and obedience. Cain, unbelief and rebellion. No obedience. Rebellion. Here the whole matter rested. Cain and Abel represent two classes that will exist in the world till the close of time. So Cain and Abel are still with us. That's all there is. One class avail themselves of the appointed sacrifice for sin. The other venture to depend upon their own merits. It is only through the merits of Jesus that our transgressions can be pardoned. Now, you'll notice the way she worded that. She says, one class shall avail themselves of the appointed sacrifice for sin. What is the sacrifice for sin? It's for our whole past life, up until the time we become Christians. And from that point on, we're supposed to be learning not to sin. You see, we have to read these senses right. If we read them uh, under the righteousness by faith, by now we're going to get it all wrong. 
So we've got to get over that idea of righteousness by faith as a means of eternal salvation. Spiritual gifts, page 48. A light flashes from heaven and consumes the offering of Abel. Cain sees no manifestation that his is accepted. He is angry with the Lord. <laughs> now that's a wonderful way to worship, isn't it? <laughs> angry with the Lord and with his brother. God condescends to send an angel to Cain to converse with him. The angel inquires of him the reason of his anger and informs him that if he does well and follows the direction of God that God has given, he will accept him and respect his offering. But even after being thus faithfully instructed, Cain did not repent. Instead of uh, censuring and abhorring himself for his unbelief, he still complains of the injustice and partiality of God. Petrarch's and Prophet 74. When Cain saw that his offering was rejected, he was angry with the Lord. And with Abel, he was angry that God did not accept man's substitute in place of the sacrifice divinely ordained, and angry with his brother for choosing to obey God instead of joining in rebellion against him. Notwithstanding Cain's disregard of the divine command, God did not leave him to himself, but he condescended in reason with the man who had shown himself so unreasonable. Christ Object Lessons, page 152. The Lord had respect to his offering, but to Cain and his offering, he had no respect. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 395. Ministers would reach many more hearts if they would dwell more on practical godliness. Frequently, when efforts are made to introduce the truth into new fields, the force is almost entirely theoretical. That's what our, our men do. The people are unsettled. They see the force of truth and are anxious to obtain a sure foundation. When their feelings are softened, is the time, above all others, to urge the religion of Christ home upon its conscience. But too often the course of lectures have been allowed to close without their work being done for the people in which they are needed. That effort was too much like the offering of Cain. It had not the sacrificial blood to make it acceptable to God. Cain was right in making an offering, but he left out all that made it of any value, the blood of the atonement. Now, that's hard to imagine that that's what we are doing today in our meetings. We bring people up to a certain point in understanding. They sense it but then we don't bring it to them. And so they figure, well, it must not really be necessary. And so we get half converted people. Father, we thank thee for this material. May we really get it home. May we understand the true plan of salvation. It's a plan of obedience and loyalty after we have been justified. Help us understand this and let us come all the way. Let us follow Jesus into the kingdom. Amen.